Okay, well, moving on, lecture 4.2, niches and community interactions. The far side says, in case you can't see it, is Henry, our party's total chaos. No one knows when to eat, where to stand, what to, oh, thank God. Here comes the border collie. A little bit off the beaten path there, definitely different. But our goal is to analyze how population size is determined by births, deaths, immigration, emigration, and limiting factors, biotic and abiotic, that determine carrying capacity. All right, our objectives are to define niche, describe the role of competition plays in shaping communities, describe the role predation and herbivory play in shaping communities, and identify three types of symbiotic relationships in nature too. So keep those in mind as we go on through. So think about it. If someone asks where an organism, li organism lives, that person might answer on a coral reef or in the desert. These answers give the environment or location, but ecologists need more information to understand fully why an organism lives where it does and how it fits into its surroundings. So what else do scientists need to know? First of all, they need to understand their niches. So what is a niche? Every species has its own range of tolerance the ability to survive and reproduce under a range of environmental circumstances. I'm sure you can imagine that. If it gets too, 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 too hot, you're not going to be able to survive, or too, 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 too cold, you can't live there either. So when an environmental condition such as temperature extends in either direction beyond an organism's optimum range, the organism experiences stress. The organism must expend more energy to maintain homeostasis, and so has less energy for, left for growth and reproduction. Organisms have an upper and lower limit of tolerance, as you can see from the graph, um, for every environmental factor. And beyond those limits, the organism simply cannot survive. A species' tolerance for environmental conditions then helps determine its habitat, the general place where an organism lives. An organism's niche describes not only where it lives, but how it interacts with biotic and abiotic factors in the environment. In other words, an organism's niche includes not only the physical and biological aspects of its environment, but also the way in which the organism uses them to survive and reproduce. The term resource can refer to any necessity of life, such as water, nutrients, light, food, or space. For plants, resources include sunlight, water, and soil nutrients. For animals, Resources include nesting space, shelter, types of food, plants, and feed. Part of an organism niche in involves the abiotic factors it requires for survival. Most amphibians, for example, lose and absorb water through their skin, so they must live in moist places. If an area is too hot and dry or too cold for too long, most amphibians cannot survive. Biological aspects of an organism's niche involves the biotic factors it requires for survival, such as when and how it reproduces, the food it eats, and why in which it, and, and the way in which it obtains that food. For example, birds on Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean all live in the same habitat, but they prey on fish of different sizes and feed in different places. Thus, each species occupies a distinct niche. So our objective was to define niche. A niche is the range of physical and biological conditions in which a species lives and the way the species obtains what it needs to survive and reproduce. Next objective is, is to describe the role competition plays in shaping communities. All right. How one organism interacts with another organism is an important part of defining its niche. Competition occurs when organisms attempt to use the same limited ecological resources in the same place at the same time. In a forest, for example, plant roots compete for resources such as water and nutrients in the soil. Animals compete for resources such as food, mates, and places to live and raise their young. Competition can occur both between members of the same species, known as intraspecific competition, and members of different species known as interspecific competition. Direct competition between different species almost always produces a winner and a loser, and the losing species dies out. In the experiment shown in the graph, 
Two species of paramecia were first grown in separate cultures, the dash lines. In but under the same conditions, both populations grew under those conditions. However, when the species were grown together in the same culture, the solid line, one species outcompeted the other. The last the, and the last competitive species did not survive, which would be the yellow line. The competitive exclusion pr principle states that no two species can occupy exactly the same niche in exactly the same habitat at exactly the same time. If two species attempt to occupy the same niche, one species will be better at competing for limited resources and will eventually exclude the other species. As a result of competition, competitive exclusion, excuse me, natural communities rarely have niches that overlap significantly. Instead of competing for similar resources, species then usually divide them. For example, the three species of North American warblers shown all live in the same trees and feed on insects. But one species feeds on the higher branches, other feeds on the lower branches, and other feeds in the middle. The resources utilized by these species are similar, yet they're different. Therefore, each species has its own niche and competition is minimized. This division of resources was likely brought about by past competition among the birds. By causing species to divide resources, competition helps determine the number and the kinds of species in a community and the niche each species occupies. So objective two was to describe the comp role competition plays in shaping communities. By causing species to divide resources, competition helps determine the number and kinds of species in a community and the niche in each species, in the niche each species occupies. So moving on, objective three, three. Describe the role predation and herbivory play in shaping communities. You've heard about this a hundred times already. An interaction in which one animal, the predator, captures and feeds on another animal, the prey, is called predation. Predators can affect the size of prey population in a community and determine the places that prey can live and feed. Birds of prey, for example, can play an important role in regulating the population sizes of mice, voles, and other small animals. This graph shows an idealized computer model of changes in predator and prey populations over time. An interaction in which one animal, the herbivore, feeds on producers such as plants is called herbivory. Herbivores, like the ring-tailed lemur, can affect both the size and distribution of plant populations in a community and determine the places that certain plants can survive and grow. For example, very dense populations of white-tailed deer are eliminating their food plants from many places across the United States. And this is a problem, because then they can't survive, they don't have food. Sometimes changes in the population of a single species, often called a keystone species, can cause dramatic changes in the structure of a community. For example, in the cold waters off the Pacific coast of North America, Sea otters devour large quantities of sea urchins. Urchins are herbivores whose favorite food is kelp, giant algae that grow in undersea forest. A century ago, sea otters were nearly eliminated by hunting. Unexpectedly, the kelp forest nearly vanished because the sea urchins were eating it. Without otters as predators, the sea urchin population skyrocketed. The armies of urchins devoured kelp down to the bare rock. Without kelp to provide habitat, Many other animals, including seabirds, disappeared. Otters were a keystone species in this community. After otters were protected as an endangered species, their population began to recover. As otters returned, the sea otter population dropped and the kelp forest began to thrive again. Recently, however, the otter population has begun falling again, and no one knows why. They're trying to figure that out. But they are awfully cute, aren't they? So objective three was to describe the role predation and herbivory play in shaping communities. Predators can affect the size of prey populations in a community and determine the places prey can live and feed. Herbivores can affect both the size and distribution of plant populations in a community and, de and determine the places that certain plants can grow and, sur and survive. 
Objective 4. Identify the three types of symbiotic relationships in nature. Any relationship in which two species live closely together is called symbiosis, which means living together. And the three main classes of symbiotic relationship in nature are mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. So let's look at mutualism first. The sea anemone's sting has two functions, to capture prey and protect the anemone from predators. Even so, certain fish manage to snack on anemone tentacles. The clownfish, however, is immune to the anemone stings. When threatened by a predator, clownfish seek shelter by snuggling deep into the anemone's tentacles. If an anemone-eating species tries to attack the anemone, the clownfish dart out and chase away the predators. And this kind of relationship between species in which both benefit is known as mutualism. Moving on to something <coughs> a little less happy. Tapeworms. <coughs> Excuse me live in the intestines of mammals where they absorb large amounts of their host's food. Fleas, ticks, lice, and the leech shown, or that's not leech, that's a tapeworm, live in the bodies of mammals and feed on their blood and skin. These are examples of parasitism, relationships in which one organism lives inside or on another organism and then harms it too. The parasite obtains all or part of its nutritional needs from the host organism. Generally, parasites weaken but not, do not kill their host, which is usually larger than the parasite. If they kill them, they wouldn't have anywhere else to go, would they? Barnacles often attach themselves to whale skin. They perform no known service to the whale, but nor do they harm it. Yet the barnacles benefit from the constant movement of water that is full of food particles past the swimming whale. This is an example of commensalism. It's a relationship in which one organism benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed. So the whale's neither, neither helped nor harmed. So objective four is to identify the three types of symbiotic relationships in nature. They recognize mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. So to review, ask yourself, can you define a niche? Describe the role competition plays in shaping communities. Describe the role predation and herbivory play in shaping communities and identify the three types of symbiotic relationships in nature. Not a difficult lesson, so I hope you can. And here is your cute picture while I turn off the video.